All right, welcome everyone to our first uh, video lecture for um, Philosophy 360 for Business Ethics, Spring 2019. Um, those of you who are already here in the chat, uh, hello again. Uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, I hope this you got to the page. That's great. You're watching the video. That's good. Um, so I guess if there's any troubles, you aren't hearing me talk about it right now. <laughs> I don't have to work it out. Um, but this is uh, this is going to be um, a little bit of an adventure. I, when I taught this class online before, it took us a couple weeks before everything got worked out. But um, so far, I'm not getting my phone's not blowing up with text messages from people saying they can't figure it out. So, and we've got eight people here already, which is awesome. Um, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube later, I do really encourage you, if it's possible for you to attend, you don't have to attend these things uh, live when I'm recording them, but Definitely, uh, all the live participants are very, very welcome and very much valued by me. Um, and your participation is something I really appreciate. Uh, it improves my lectures because my students always draw material out of me that I wasn't planning on talking about that sometimes ends up being really fruitful. And then I work into my lectures the next time I teach the class because I can now anticipate it. Um, but also it just helps uh, from, well, it helps to know if what I'm talking about is making sense or whether I need to kind of go back over it again or try explaining it in a different way, things like that. Um, but also personally, I appreciate it because uh, I have recorded live video lectures before where no one was there and it just sort of feels existentially different to me. <laughs> I'm just talking into the box by myself in my apartment late at night on a Thursday night. Um, so the fact that I just know there are some people here with me right now, um, uh, is something I personally appreciate and am thankful for. So thank you to everyone who's there uh, tonight, and and please don't be shy about jumping in and asking questions and and giving comments and all the stuff we do if we were in class together. I want to try to replicate that as much as possible. Um, the if we were meeting in person today, my um, oh the other thing is uh, I remember from doing this last time. Sometimes internet cuts out or something weird happens. Anyone in chat, if uh, you get dropped, if my microphone cuts out, if my video cuts out, if there's any kind of those technical difficulties that happen, please just send me a text on my phone and let me know what's going on and I will, um, I can pause the video and try to solve it and, and get you back on. Because if you're taking the time to join me on a Thursday night for two hours listening to a lecture, I want to make sure it actually ends up working out for you. So. Please let me know if you get in any trouble. Don't be shy about uh, interrupting things for something like that. Yes, it is a huge phone. This is my life hack. My, I, I thank my sister for this. Um, because it's a tablet, I it doesn't count as a cell phone. And so I've been able to use Google Voice instead of having to buy a cell line and pay for that. So that's pretty cool. Um, anyway, um, someone in the chat asked about my huge phone. Yes, it is. It's pretty big. Sometimes I feel stupid on the street, but anyway. Um, where was I? Oh, uh, so if we were going to have this class in person today, like with my, my 260 version of the class, we, we meet in person Tuesday, Thursdays, then I would have wanted to start with asking about um, any leftover things to discuss about the Code of Intellectual Conduct. Because on Tuesday, we got to talk about it a little bit, but I have a, a suspicion or an intuition that there's probably more that people might want to ask about with regard to the code. Um, because we don't have the full class here, not even a majority, I'm thinking I'll save that um, as a thread to pick up again next Tuesday when we see each other in person um, and see if there is anything left over. If some of you weren't able to watch the uh, Code of Intellectual Conduct videos in time for class on last Tuesday, two days ago, then try to finish those up and if you've got thoughts and reactions, write them down before you forget them. Um, I always, I run in, if you're like me, uh, I always run into this problem where uh, I have an idea and I'm like, that idea is so cool or it's so important that I won't possibly forget it. I don't need to write it down. And then what happens? I forget it. So um, I definitely want to give you the space to, to talk about and share your opinions and perspectives um, about the code. Uh, if it's something that we want to kind of move forward together in consensus about as a class. That that whole can't say yes if you can't say no thing. I really want to make sure that there's that opportunity respected. So if you've got questions, if you have concerns, write them down. I want to hear about them. Um, and we'll do that a little bit on 
Tuesday. Um, so I'm going to kind of just get started here tonight with some of those leftover topics I put on the board that were definitely way too ambitious for us to cover on Tuesday, but we're going to try to knock out as many of them as we can tonight. And just as a reminder, there were four topics that I have as things I definitely want to touch on at least a little bit before we move on to the actual ethical theories, these classical ethical theories that um, are going to be the, the main bulk of our crash course in ethical theory. Um, these four topics are kind of a bridge between the kind of process and method um, material that is happening with the code of intellectual conduct when we're talking about like how do we want to do what we're going to be doing in the class, truth seeking through uh, critical debate, that kind of thing, um, exploring controversies and disagreements. Um, and then, it, so it's a bridge between that method kind of stuff and then the sort of substantive theories of people offering their best efforts at trying to explain and understand what this whole morality thing is all about. And those are the those are the core theories that we're going to be going to. So these four topics kind of sit in between because they're definitely relevant for the how of how we're going to go about this, but they're also starting to make some more substantive commitments about what's good and bad and what's right and wrong and what's the nature of moral truths or do if they even exist um, <clears throat> and what's the nature of morality itself so um, these will be a little bit of a transition for us uh, the four topics again um, in case you forgot what I had on the board um, I want to talk about emotions and specifically the possible role that emotions can play in rational discourse and debate um, I'd like to talk about religion slash culture for largely the same reasons um, and th those are definitely more on the method side, um, but also uh, the next two topics, they're kind of sneaking closer to a substantive content side, and that would be the topic of egoism and relativism. In my 260 on-campus class that I had earlier today, we didn't re we just got into relativism by the end, so we didn't knock out all four, and depending on how much there is uh, discussion-wise here, um, my 260 class, we definitely went on our share of tangents, um, and it was all really, really good. And that's um, that's something I hope we can create with the eight people who are here uh, with me tonight um, as much as possible. Because what um, some of you may have some experience with philosophy in the past, uh, or even with ethics, um, kind of studying ethics more directly and explicitly. Or theoretically um, but maybe for some of you this is something very very new and when something's new you maybe don't know what questions to ask might want to kind of sit back and watch and see what's happening but um, because we're trying to like hit the ground running to get to these topics as soon as possible I think the most efficient way we can go is if you uh, share questions that you have or things that you're confused about where you're like okay Tim's laying down some groundwork stuff here, but I'm not following what's going on or why this matters or what significance it has or why this instead of something else. Ask those questions even if they feel to you like dumb questions or something like that because we're we're going to be setting the foundations here for the entire rest of the quarter. Um, and there's a lot of stuff we could end up talking about. Like um, my, my class earlier today brought up things I wasn't necessarily anticipating and there were certain concepts that... Um, I thought um, would be something we could move through a little bit more quickly, and it's something we I, I took more time with. And if that's, <coughs> pardon me, if that's something going on with you, you're not the only one. I guarantee it. Bring it up. Share share what your experience is with what we're talking about, and we'll process it and digest it. Um, and and also on this theme, as a reminder, in a class like this, in a philosophy class, especially one on ethics. I want you to be critically thinking for yourself. So I'm not the authority here. If I lay down some stuff, even if it's stuff I'm saying is like relatively uncontroversial in philosophy, if it's not uncontroversial to you, we should talk about that. If you're like, I'm not so sure about that, or I've got some concerns about moving in that direction or committing to that line of thinking uh, or adopting that kind of perspective, let's, let's process that. This is as much a matter of familiarity with concepts and ideas as it is deciding what you think about it like are are you gonna buy that for a dollar or not right so you got to make some decisions there okay um, 
So let's um any any questions from the chat so far? How are we doing so far? Good? Sweet. For those of you watching on YouTube later, I'll be kind of at, at times pausing and waiting for people to type comments in if there's anything going on. Lovely. Awesome. If it's ever not good, interrupt me anytime. Okay. So <clears throat> the first topic I want to talk about is emotions. And um, I'm going to turn my hat for this whole section. Um, like I just said, I'm not an authority, but there's some moments in which I want to e be even less considered that way. I want to especially emphasize how I, the, when I turn the hat, it's sort of like me saying the ideas I'm about to throw down are just my best efforts at making sense of this. If the ideas make sense to you, they hold water. Great. If you don't agree with them, feel free to disagree. This is, I'm, I'm definitely not the last word or the final authority on any of this stuff. And a lot of times, um, when I'm turning the hat, I'm registering or describing a philosophical position, um, or you might say opinion, but a supported one. I'll always argue for it, um, but on something that is controversial. So um, something where I'm aware there are going to be other philosophers or even people who are not philosophers who are going to take issue with this or disagree with it or, or want to go in a different direction with it. And I think the question of what to do with emotions in debate is a controversial question. There's a lot of different concerns that might lead on one side or the other or different hybrids. My my kind of stance on emotions here is going to be a, a kind of two-part thing. So I'll talk about one part here of my like suggestion or proposal for how we understand the proper role for emotions um, when we're having these rational debates and, and exploring our disagreements with argument. Um, and uh, and then I'll go after the second piece. So kind of jumping back to the code here, again, to like bridge us over. In some ways, I could describe the whole project of the code or the whole project of critical thinking is to try to avoid having arbitrary beliefs. Um, we have beliefs for a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of uh, different mechanisms that might contribute to um, why we end up having the beliefs that we do. With critical reasoning, you want to have something to say for yourself here. Like, there's this option, there's this option, there's all these perspectives out there. There's a bunch of opinions to choose from if you're trying to decide what's going to be my opinion. Why would you choose one of these over the other? On what grounds, What? how could you justify saying yes to this and no to something else? And to be able to say yes to everything is just not possible. Um, there, We'll talk about that. Uh, why that isn't a possibility probably a little bit later when we get into relativism here. Um, but that uh, certainly the, some of the options, the different perspectives here are mutually exclusive. They directly disagree. So they can't both be true and false simultaneously. That's a paradox. Um, logical contradictions are uh, not possible. If you want to have a little side talk topic about that basic principle of logic, I'd be very happy to. Sometimes students want to talk about that. But it is, it's sort of the founding principle of logic that claims are either true or they're false. They can't be both true and false, and they can't be neither true nor false. And the weight of that principle, I could go into a little deeper story here, but in case you're curious, the weight of that what we call the principle of non-contradiction is that without it, all reasoning goes out the window. There's no way in which some line of thinking has more rational justification than anything else. Every, everything, it's a kind of rational pessimism. Um, making arguments becomes irrelevant if uh, contradictions can exist, and there's a, a logical proof about that. But also, there's a concern about whether, um, even, even if uh, you could somehow save rationality without the principle of non-contradiction, there's a concern about whether it reduces any claim we make to meaninglessness. And I said I wasn't going to draw on this piece of paper because I can't fix the video. It's all backwards. Like, if I write my name, that looks goofy to you on YouTube. Um, but uh, I, I can draw a very simple diagram here. So let's say I wanted to say that a, a claim was both true and that it was false. So sorry, people who are watching this right now, but I wrote that F backwards. So <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. 
You want to say it's true and false simultaneously. But one way to think about the meaning of the claims that we make is that they're intelligible in as much as I understand what it would mean for it to be true or what would it mean for it to be false. In other words, even if I don't know whether the claim is true or false, I can understand what you're saying if I know uh, what, um, what cases would count as cases in which your claim would be true. In other words, what are the cases over here on this side in which your claim comes out true versus the claims over here on this side where the claim comes out false? Now let me give you a simple example. Here's a claim. There are aliens on Alpha Centauri that love Nicolas Cage movies. Now, I don't know whether that claim is true or false, and I don't think you do either. But we definitely think that there is a truth to that claim. It is, in fact, true or false. We just don't have access to that. Like, we have to go to Alpha Centauri and find out. But when I make that claim, even though you don't know whether it's true or false, you definitely have a way of thinking about imagining what sorts of cases would count as cases in which my claim was true and what kinds of cases would be claims in which it is false. So, for example, if you're imagining that there are no aliens on Alpha Centauri, then my claim would be false. If you're imagining that there are aliens on Alpha Centauri and we go there and we talk to them, and they end up saying, we hate Nicolas Cage movies, or we've never seen them, then my claim would be false too. Um, but you can imagine going there, talking to them, and being like, or, or not even us going there, but just like, they're chilling out on Alpha Centauri, they're picking up on our radio signals, they're watching Saturday matinees of old Nicolas Cage movies, like Con Air or something, and they're just having a gas, right? They're just having so much fun watching them. That would be a case in which my claim would be true. Right? But I don't know what it is, but the claim is intelligible in as much as I know where this line is drawn. If this line is erased because things can be true and false at the same time, then it's like, what are you saying? What are you committing to? If I don't know what it would mean for it to be true rather than false, or false rather than true. So that's a, that's a little quick primer on the principle of non-contradiction. Um, so backing up here to where I got on this tangent. The whole purpose of this kind of critical debate is to have non-arbitrary beliefs. We want to have reasons to justify. Why would I choose this versus this? I can't have it all. I can't say that they're all true or that they're, well, maybe I can say that they're all false, but I can't say that they're all true. Um, all these different options of perspectives on something. I might try to say, hey, this perspective and this perspective are actually compatible. They might be able to, you know, I can, I can, believe in both simultaneously without any logical contradictions. But then what you're proposing is another view, a view that takes them as a hybrid, um, that uh, makes a pluralistic account of how to answer that question. And pluralistic accounts are not easy to justify. It's not like if you're just able to throw a bone to all the different parties in the debate that therefore your position is better. Um, there can be a lot of difficulties not only in any objections that the individual things that you're combining might have. Like when you do a pluralism, you want the best of both worlds. That's the that's the motivation for pluralism. But you also might inherit the worst of all worlds too. Like every idea may have some baggage of objections to it, and just adding in the other options may not satisfy those objections. So you might have just compounded the problems that uh, you have to shoulder your burden of proof on. Also, when you do a pluralistic answer, you now start to have to uh, answer questions and justify how these things fit together. Like, why should we think that they go together? Rather than just having a kind of Frankenstein monster of beliefs that don't necessarily, like, maybe you can accept them all at the same time, but what sort of vision is emerging there? How do they fit together neatly rather than in a sort of ad hoc, again, arbitrary sort of way? So, um, how chat? How am I doing so far? Is this making sense? Have any questions popped up with the stuff I've been talking about so far? Thumbs up. Cool. Awesome. I'm covering a lot of ground pretty fast, so I'm getting. I just got a little paranoid, so I wanted to check in. Okay. Cool. Thank you for positive feedback. Awesome. Okay. Okay. I'll keep trucking. Stop me at any time.
still building trust. <laughs> I want to trust you that if you've got something going on, you'll let me know. Um, don't be shy about pumping the brakes. That's totally, totally okay. I, I know I've said it like three times already in this video, but if you've got a question, there is someone watching this on YouTube later who's going to have the same question or a very similar one. So uh, even if everyone else in chat is like, I'm doing great, and you're like, oh, I'm not doing great. Um, share what's going on with you and and I'm sure it's gonna it's not just you okay um, so why am I talking about this if the concern about critical discourse is we want to avoid having arbitrary beliefs we want to have some case to be made for why to choose something versus something else so like why should we consider this the most rationally defensible position this is where emotions come in and for some people there's a concern that emotions are exactly the kinds of belief influencing forces that we th would be worried about if we're trying to have non-arbitrary beliefs. Um, when we uh, talk about bias, I think oftentimes that word gets tossed around in less than critical ways and we, ha we have to be careful about it. I, I sometimes joke um, when I'm doing philosophy of language with some of my other uh, classes that if um, if some uh, alien from another planet like came down to America, American English, observing us using this language, and they were just trying to infer what the word bias means based on our use of it, they might come up with the definition that bias is something that you call when you recognize that there's a pattern to someone's thinking and you don't like it. And that definition of bias is not going to work for us. But something... Um, I think is a, a step in the right direction. Maybe this could be improved upon, but as a quick and dirty definition, I like calling bias, uh, saving that word to describe cases of forces that are irrational or irrational that contribute to belief formation. So things that influence the beliefs that we have that's not on the basis of sensitivity to argument or evidence. And emotions might qualify as that. They are causal features of our psychology that we don't necessarily endorse or decide upon, and that can have influence on us in ways that are not consciously recognized and thus maybe not available for rational reflection about, um, or at least they might exert that kind of influence. Um, a lot of times emotions may not be a response to some kind of rational consideration, but are due to arbitrary forces. There's been a lot of work done, especially in the last 20, 30 years, in moral psychology about all of these different forces of confabulation. And confabulation is a special SAT word, I know. Um, confabulation, as a, just a quick definition, is when, uh, you know how you like, might lie to other people to try to mislead them about what you're thinking or what you really believe or what you've actually done? Um, confabulation is when you lie to yourself and you believe your own bullshit. That's confabulation. And we do a lot of confabulation in especially our moral judgments and, uh, and our, the stability with which we apply our moral values to situations looks to be fairly weak um, if you uh, take the evidence of these studies that have been done. One of my favorites is um, this study uh, took um, a surveys of participants uh, where they, it asked them to kind of self-identify what their moral values and principles are that direct their choices. And then they had them do a kind of like case by case, like here's a case, what do you think is the right judgment here? Here's a case, should this person be punished or not? And what they found is that the responses that people gave to the case scenarios did not in a statistically significant way track what they reported as their beliefs and values. And in fact, and this is the goofy part of the study, the most significant variable, the most statistically significant variable that determined what kinds of answers people gave was whether or not there was a can of stinky garbage underneath the table while they were taking the, the survey. <laughs> that, was, that was it, right? So it's just some environmental feature can put me in a kind of more sour mood and, and then I start judging people more harshly morally just because I'm smelling stinky garbage while I'm thinking about it. Like that's a, that's a rationally arbitrary feature but it can still influence us. So some people that are worried about emotions and giving them too much role in rational discourse are worried you're just opening the door up for bias. And that's why I think some people are motivated to say that when you're gonna have 
a truth-seeking debate, a sincere, truth-seeking, rational debate, you should check your emotions at the door. I don't agree with that. Hat turned. I don't agree with that. What I do, what I am willing to concede, though, and I think there's good grounds to concede, is to see that, uh, or to, to, to treat emotions as in themselves not constituting evidence. So how I feel about my belief is not in itself <clears throat> uh, a basis for confidence or conviction in that belief being true. So I'm, what I'm denying to emotions by making that move is giving them evidentiary status. Now, of course, the fact that I'm feeling a certain way counts as evidence for something, like uh, the feelings I have might be evidence for what kind of character I have or something like that. But in terms of the emotional connection with a belief, the, the level of my emotional commitment is not itself a sign of the belief being true. That's the first half of my proposal. Now, the other half is going to qualify that a little bit. But um, one final thing about what motivates me here. Um, <clears throat> so if we did think of emotions as evidence in, its, uh, in themselves, like the emotions themselves intrinsically have this uh, evidentiary status that they sort of prove that a belief is true uh, or contribute something toward uh, my confidence in it being true. Then uh, the stage is set for something that happens all too often when we're disagreeing with each other, which is we get into a yelling match. And I think that what, what's sort of going on in a yelling match is each person is trying to kind of demonstrate to the other that their emotional commitment to their side of the debate goes deeper than the other person's does, and so they're more right. And that doesn't seem to me to be rationally justified. That seems arbitrary to me. So that's part of what motivates me here. And this doesn't even have to happen with other people. I mean, this can just happen with you and yourself. Like, I don't know about you, but I got a lot of voices in my head. I got a lot of feelings. They're not always on the same page. And sometimes it's like there's a little arms race happening with my emotions in my head. Like one of them speaks up and then the other one's like, no, 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 I'm more important here. Pay attention to me. And they go back and forth and sooner or later I'm exhausted and tired and don't have any bandwidth yet to think about the, whatever I was thinking about. Um, I don't know if that resonates with any of you, <laughs> but um, that is something I've encountered as a human being and I've heard other people describe it happens for them as well. Oh, what was that? Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, where was I? Um, oh, <laughs> it's okay. Um, oh, Jessica's got something to say. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry, I forgot. I was mentioning this earlier, Leticia, before you showed up. If you'd be willing to mute your microphone um, until you have something to say or to contribute, that would be lovely. Um, do you know how to do that? Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. All right. So, so that's the one half of it. Um, I don't think that we should treat emotions as having this kind of direct evidentiary status. However, like I said, I really don't like the idea of saying you have to check your emotions at the door in order to participate in a rational debate. Otherwise, you're being irrational or hysterical or something like that, right? And there's a couple reasons why. <clears throat> that I'll, I want to articulate explicitly. The first is that that may not be possible for some people with respect to certain topics. And to put that as a condition effectively means to silence them or to say you, you can't legitimately participate in this discussion because of your emotional baggage. And that seems really wrong to me because oftentimes the people who are going to be in a position to have strong emotional reactions to a topic are the people for whom the topic is the most directly relevant. They're like, they have experience with it or they're affected by it or something like that, right? The emotions don't come from nowhere. They come from somewhere. And uh, they very much probably have to do with the topic that's being debated. And so I want their voices at the table. We can't, we can't lose them. The other thing is that instead of trying to censor people, we might try to censor topics. We might be like, oh, well, that's a topic that's too emotional, so we can't talk about it rationally, so we're not going to work on it. 
but that's also a pretty big loss. The, the kinds of topics that are the most emotionally provocative are usually the ones that are the most important. Maybe not always. Maybe I should put it this way. A lot of the topics or disagreements that are the ones we most need to put some work into are usually ones that have strong emotional affordances, that they have a strong potential to be emotionally instigating or provoking. So we need to talk about this stuff. And ethics is at the top of the list there, right? I think I might have mentioned the uh, when we were together last about the Thanksgiving topics, like the things don't talk about at Thanksgiving. That's the kind of phenomenon I'm talking about right now. Um, it, that that kind of policy to say we are not going to talk about these topics because they're too emotionally provocative. That that's that can't be adequate. That can't be a that's not going to be a good policy for us to run with. I think because those topics are so important, and we can't always wait until we're in a good state. That said, just as a little side note here, I do think it's good advice to recognize when's the right time to have a conversation. So maybe never is the right time, and then you just have to do it anyway. But you know, the, I think the the to the extent to which we can um, kind of cool down the emotions is going to be helpful. Maybe not a deal maker, deal breaker here for whether we should have the conversation, but I definitely think it helps. And the reason why is going to come into what I'm going to say about the second half. So as a little transition here, um, <clears throat> what are emotions? Well. There's a lot of different theories to how to understand them, but one thing seems very clear from work I've done with cognitive science and philosophy of mind, that emotions have the functional effect of directing attention, like a spotlight or a flashlight. Like emotions call attention to something, sometimes in a pretty vague way, like it's indeterminate what is being pointed out, but it's sort of like something is happening. It's in, Emotions are like indicators, and the louder they are, the stronger the emotions, the more they direct the attention in a way where you like don't have the ability to look at anything else. So when emotions are very, very strong, our bandwidth for considering lots of different options, like you got to do when you're having critical debate and trying to be charitable to your opponents and all that kind of stuff, your bandwidth to work with here is very limited. And that's why sometimes it's better to wait until they've cooled down a little bit. But that's a matter of the intensity of the emotions, not emotions themselves. That That's kind of part of my next point here. Um, I, I, I might have mentioned that uh, I identify as Buddhist, and I've been practicing Buddhism and meditation for, gosh, ooh, I'm close to 20 years now. Wow, that's hard to believe. That's I've known Buddhism more than I haven't known Buddhism, and I wasn't raised in a Buddhist culture, so that's kind of I never even thought about that till right now. Um, but what I found with meditation is that um, my emotions might quiet down, but they're still present. And when they're all chilled out, there's space for more of them. And I remember really something that struck me very early on when I was practicing meditation was that I started feeling really weird feelings that I didn't have words for, or names for, that were like strange cocktails of emotions mixed together. Um, I still, the one that left the biggest imprint on me that I still remember to this day very distinctly uh, is, and I still sometimes feel it, or oftentimes feel it, um, I guess, is uh, joyful melancholy. That was the label I decided to put to it, joyful melancholy. Um, and that can't happen when the joy or the melancholy is so loud that it's like taking all the attention. So um, that I think is good advice. Um, there's a certain point at which having these tough debates are challenging, and I think all of us have a certain, well, my partner's a therapist, so I got this term from her, um, we have a certain distress tolerance, like how much distress can be happening inside us or in our environment before we're like, too much, I eject, eject, I got to get out of here, right? If you cross the line of your distress tolerance, then you're in the realm of trauma. Um, and distress tolerance grows, like you can build it over time. It's, it's a character trait like anything else. And I think you build it by kind of living on the edges of it, but not crossing over. When you cross over it, then that, can, that shuts things down and, and sort of, I think, exerts this force of limiting, uh, in the long term even, your distress tolerance. Um, 
So that's always something to keep an eye on. And you might have the distress tolerance for the conversation, but your conversational partner might not. And it's good to be sensitive to that. But I'm, I'm getting on a little tangent here about psychology now. Um, but still things I think are good and useful for like thinking about like the code of intellectual conduct and stuff like that. But back to the second half here of my proposal about emotions. Not evidence, but still has a role to play in reasoning, in my opinion. And the best way I have to describe this quickly is a kind of metaphor. Um, imagine I'm a police investigator and I am working on a really big case, but I don't know what's going on yet. I've got some clues and I'm, you know, late in the office one night doing some research on my computer, trying to figure out what's going on here. Maybe making a plan for my investigations for the next day. And I get a phone call. Pick up the phone. And it's like a weird garbled voice on the other end of the mo uh, microphone. It's like, this is the person who committed the crime. And then click. So I, I, got, I got an anonymous tip. Now, are anonymous tips uh, admissible in court as evidence? No, they're not. I can't go on the stand and be like, that's the person who did the crime. And they're like, how do you know that? And I'm like, well, I got an anonymous tip one night. And this guy, I don't know who it was, but they said it, that they did it. So there. Like, that's never going to fly in the court of law. But if I'm thinking and reflecting on this anonymous tip, and I'm thinking, well, because I can't use this tip in court, I'm just going to ignore it. I'd be a pretty bad investigator. And right? I, have, I have kind of an obligation here. Um, do my due diligence. I've received a lead, and I need to follow up on that lead. Now, that lead might pan out to be nothing, but for me to just ignore it would be wrong. And that's how I feel about emotions. Emotions as indicators um, of sensitivity that draw attention to something. And while they may not be evidence in themselves, they might be the path that gets me in contact with some evidence or argument or reasoning that r is really important and relevant to the critical debate that we're having or the issue that I'm considering. Um, and if I didn't follow up on that lead, if I didn't take the time to listen to my emotions and track them down and see, like, what are you trying to tell me, emotion? I might miss out on that stuff. I mean, our, I, I mentioned earlier our emotions are indicators. Sometimes, especially in moral matters, I think they can be indicators of, uh, of how we're sensitive to certain morally relevant features, like recognizing uh, injustice or unfairness or cruelty or a lack of compassion or something like that, that there's something goofy going on. Um, even and, and especially when we aren't trained in theoretical ethics and don't have those like conceptual principles at our fingertips to describe what we're seeing right in front of us, we might be like, I'm getting a bad vibe off of this. I can't maybe articulate exactly what my moral problem is with it, but there's something going on here that I'm intuitively sensitive with. And how? what's the mechanism of that intuition? Emotional reactions to it. And I think... While I, I can't just maybe trust those emotions directly, and, and part of that reason is that they can be sensitive, they can be indicators of factors that are not relevant to the debate or not rationally relevant at all um, and are arbitrary or illegitimate, um, they sometimes can also be uh, getting us in touch with legitimate things. So um, when I have emotional reactions related to some critical debate, um, the first thing I do, and uh, maybe I, I don't want to go through this totally blow by blow. We're all different people, so your mileage may vary in using the technique. But the general thing I'm encouraging is listen to emotions and see what they direct your attention to. And then you have to kind of weigh what they're getting their attention to in, and see what can that possibly contribute as a reason or argument or evidence for something. Um, but at that point, you can kind of let the emotion go. So when, when, I'm, when I've got emotional reactions to these things, the first thing I do is take a deep breath, connect with peace. Buddhism helps with this. Meditation helps with that. But then try to be friendly to myself. So first, accept that I have the feeling. If I'm ignoring my feeling or I don't want to have that feeling or something like that, then this isn't going to work. Um, so I, I think that is a, a step to take. And then I try to listen to it. And I'm like, what do you got to say to me, emotion? I'm, I'm willing to listen. I'm going to entertain it. Kind of like fallibility principle or something. Maybe I'm wrong, even if I don't like you emotion, but I'm, I'm going to give you some space here. I'm going to hear you out and see what you got to say. Have charity, right, to your own emotions. And I see where it leads my, my attention, and I look over there, and I'm like, do I see anything there 
that seems to be an independent thing that's relevant for this debate. And at that point, once I've followed it to where its attention is leading me, I kind of am like, thanks, emotion. I can take it from here. Thank you for bringing this up. And now you can, you can be quiet now. And that's why I'm especially thinking your mileage may vary because detaching from the emotions uh, does always happen at the snap of a fingers whenever you want it to, or just because you've listened to it, it doesn't always just be like, okay, I've said my piece, I've been heard, and now I can leave you be. It doesn't always work that way. Um, and if it can, that's great. Um, but I do think the, the best chance of that happening happens through um, listening to it rather than trying to repress it or ignore it or whatever else, right? Um, <clears throat> that wouldn't be listening. Um, but then what I find <clears throat> sometimes when I track down my emotions, uh, a lot of times it's just my ego. It might just be my pride or my attachment to certain things um, that I don't want to admit I was wrong or um, I don't happen to like the person I now have to agree with or, or all sorts of things. And when I am able to see those things in the light, um, when they're exposed to reflection like that explicitly, then they start to lose a lot of their power. And be like, yeah, that's not legitimate. That, that's not an argument in this debate. It's not like my position should be accepted to protect my feelings or something, right? Like that's not a reason to think the belief is actually true. Um, but uh, other times I do think it, like I was saying earlier, it gets us in touch with features of a situation that are, are definitely relevant and, and in a moral context, morally relevant features that deserve to be considered or weighed. Now the emotions, um, again, especially when it comes to weighing these things for what they're worth, the emotions may not be the most trustworthy ones because different people's emotional constitutions are going to have them pick out different morally relevant features. And because of the spotlighting action that emotions have, it's very easy for, they for them to create a negative space of moral blind spots. And I think that's where a lot of people's moral disagree. Whoa, sorry, my stand just, my computer fell off my stand. Oh, I'm sorry. Especially sorry for you on YouTube. Well, and on the video chat. You probably weren't expecting that. Everyone okay? Computer's okay. Oh, my apologies on that. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, oops. Emotion, yes, I'm on a, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so they can create uh, blind spots. And I think a lot of our disagreements are of this type. Like, sure, there's values that we disagree about of whether this thing is good or whether it's bad. But a lot of times our disagreements about which things should be prioritized. And when we disagree, we're like, there's this thing. This is so important. We need to do something about this. And the other person's like, but this thing is so important. We've got to do something about this. Where it's like, what we need to do is look at those considerations side by side, take a kind of full holistic look of it, and, and figure out which of these things um, maybe we can be concerned about both of them. But there's a lot of distraction that happens. Uh, don't even get me started about politics here politicians exploit this and and actively undermine um, productive discourse because of this but what about this over here it's like those things aren't directly in contradiction with each other like th there might be an option where they can both be integrated they might have a pluralistic model here that could work other things like that so um, two reasons I, I would offer two arguments here for the second half of my position. So the first half again in summary was um, emotions are don't have evidentiary status in themselves, but they are leads that very often can contribute to finding sources of argument and evidence that is relevant to the to our critical truth seeking efforts in debate. And we can't we shouldn't ignore them. We should be exploring them, uh, following up on them like leads. Um, and taking them seriously and allowing them to be a part of the life of the debate. That it's not, uh, it's not a deal breaker if someone is emotional as a part of participating in a debate in itself. We just have to critically think about them. That, that's my kind of all things considered position. So two reasons for that second half. One, sometimes they contribute legitimate stuff. But two, even if you were kind of more on the first side of the, the initial view that I was describing that 
emotions are these forces of bias that corrupt and uh, divert our rational reflective efforts from being as robust in terms of getting us to the truth as they should be. Like, we need to be completely detached from them. If we don't listen to them, they're much more likely, I think, if we don't, like, process them in the way that I'm encouraging with, like, following them as leads and listening to what they have to say, all that kind of stuff, they're far more likely to exert an undue influence on our thinking because then they're going to be under the radar. And that's where biases are at their most powerful is when they're not recognized, when they're not on our radars, when we're not thinking about them, when we don't have our attention on them. Like I was saying earlier, when I track down my feelings and I discover that it's just my ego or my pride at the other end of that lead, then it's a lot easier for me to just be like, okay, I can laugh at it almost. Um, I also mentioned I'm Lutheran. Martin Luther says at one point, um, fart at the devil. That's what he says. He, he's got a sort of vulgar sense of humor from time to time. He says, fart at the devil. When you're being tempted, just like laugh at it. Um, that, that's a way to resist it. And, and that's what I, uh, you can do if you know what to laugh at, right? If you know what direction to send the fart. Um, but until then, the emotion is just there being like, hey, there's this important thing you're not doing or not paying attention to, and it will, it will keep sloughing attention away and distracting and weighing down the rest of our efforts. So that's my two cents on that. Um, I've talked about that long enough. Um, without faces right in front of me, sometimes I can get more rambly. How are we doing in the chat? Uh, has this been pretty clear? Um, at least what I'm proposing. Do you have any clarifying questions you're curious about? I'm very curious about what you think of as a, as a response to this proposal because um, I'm not just talking about emotions as a theoretical thing relevant to uh, debates around ethics, but I'm also thinking about it kind of like the code as a proposal for what we should expect in the class this quarter. And that my encouragement is that we give space and tolerance for people being emotional and don't think, don't disregard their perspectives just because there's emotion involved in them. That's, that's kind of the practical proposal that I'm making for us as a class. So I'm curious to hear your reactions to that. Jessica says, makes sense to me. Those of you who are watching on YouTube won't see the chat here, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on it. Me too. Mm -hmm. Looks like some other people are typing may have longer answers here. Um, Theo says, I agree the emotions also have a place in debates because without emotions, the debate would lack a major human quality, which amplifies the conversation. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that, Theo. Some of it depends on cashing out some of the ambiguous things that you're saying there, like amplifies. Um, in what sense? Like, um, I'm a, I'm a child of the humanities. I went to a liberal arts college and all that good stuff. And I been very involved in art and music and theater and film and all this kind of stuff. And I definitely like my philosophy, my rational debate with a little bit of aesthetic texture to it, if you will. Um, that's a little more human rather than this like robotic logical kind of stuff. But I mean, does that contribute to truth is a question, um, if, if how, right? Um, so maybe that, that is kind of what you have in mind. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it can be helpful for um, kind of inspiring other ideas or connections that we might not otherwise think about. A lot of us have a uh, intellectual imagination that's very connected with the emotional imagination and things like our empathy engines and stuff like that. Not necessarily so, but if you can stimulate more parts of the brain, you can get more of the juices flowing, and maybe we get more of the ideas out there. That that does sound kind of plausible to me. Um, at the at the same, is this kind of something you are, are feeling, Theo? 
That's exactly what I'm saying, lol. <laughs> awesome, cool. So here's the, here's the 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 dark side of it. Um, all that kind of aesthetic coloring can be uh, rhetoric and not substance very easily. Not always, but very easily. And we call it spin doctoring. That's what spin doctoring does. It takes the same basic idea rationally, but then dresses it all up and inspires certain attitudes and reactions to the idea that we we might be worried about that. Like being a good public speaker can actually be um, a double-edged sword uh, as a critical thinker that's sincerely engaged in truth saying, uh, truth truth seeking. So imagine like my purpose in a debate with you, like we're having a debate, and my purpose is to try to figure out the truth. And I got some ideas coming into the debate. I'm gonna like bear open my soul. I'm gonna, like, here's my notebook. What do you think? You know, like let's compare notes on this. But if I'm sharing all my ideas and I'm like an amazing orator, um, I'm like super charismatic and articulate and I'm able to like make it sound real good. And you're like, man, I'm convinced by that. Like, I don't have any objections. I might be worried like, well, is that a good thing, right? Like, are you convinced because the arguments make sense or just because I was able to make them sound good? And especially in America, I. My hat's still firmly turned here for pretty much our entire session tonight. Um, it's my observation that in America, we like confident people, and we trust them more, and we think they know more of what they're talking about, and then may not put them, uh, you know, we may not put the screws to them critically as much as someone who looks like they're fumbling around or is uncertain or not able to articulate as clearly, things like that. So I'm I'm a little bit worried about. Um, I think the aesthetic stuff has to be handled carefully. Um, I, I always love doing it. It's really fun to do it to like put some flesh on the bones, you know, of these like dry, abstract, con analytic, conceptual principles. Um, but it, it can backfire for our ultimate um, purposes if we're not careful. Um, what do you, I'm curious what you think of that, Theo, and and whether that um, is something that you you think is a, is a concern about that or or not um, while you're thinking about responding to that Walter says yes I think it sounds more uh, constructive to approach communication this way I think that in most scenarios we're expected to compete for getting ideas across and this eliminates depth in communication in general yeah I agree with that um, in in many ways the you know I described in the codes video uh, or the code videos that the model is kind of like flipping the co the competitive way of thinking about debate on its head to make it this cooperative thing that we're working together. And the same way in which you want to give that like gracious, charitable space to your opponent, like you're really interested in what they have to say. They're not just a speed bump on your way toward popular victory or something. Um, but you, you really want to take them seriously. You're interested in criticism. You welcome it. That's the same kind of graciousness that I think is appropriate to offer to our own emotions and to each other's emotions too. That we're, we're trying to work this out, right? Like like I described listening with charity to what my emotions are trying to tell me. Um, yeah, uh, Jessica says increased empathy could help you see the other's position with a more open mind, which may help you see your own fallibility. Yeah, I, so maybe also very connected to what I was just saying with, with charity. Um, empathy, though, I, I have to say, I have a small axe to grind about empathy. I've thought about giving a big campus talk because the philosophy department sometimes likes to do this. Uh, we like make these philosophy talks for the whole campus. And I've been tempted to do one that is just titled Against Empathy. Because empathy is a very common, common uh, appealed to thing in ethics. And... Um, I mean, that's a provocative title to get people to go to the talk. But I, I do have some concerns about empathy because empathy is just kind of my ability to have a, a emotional imagination and um, like high emotional intelligence, we might say. And I can use that for evil just as well as for good. Like, I actually think that many trolls, like things like internet trolls and stuff, not all of them, but some of the best ones are highly empathetic. They know exactly what they're doing, right? They know how they're going to make people feel. Um, this is why I've always liked um, Hannibal Lecter as a villain, because, and I'll talk about Hannibal Lecter when we do Kant later on. 
Um, Hannibal Lecter has like all the virtues. Like if you're like going to describe what is a virtuous person, what do they look like? What are their character traits? Like Hannibal Lecter has all of them, including empathy. I mean, he's a very empathic person. He can understand how other people are feeling that are not him uh, and the nuances of what they're going through. And that's how he's able to manipulate them. And, and then he eats people, right? So he uses all of those character traits uh, for immoral actions. So um, my, my, little, my little tiny X to grind here is just that I, I don't put my eggs in the basket of if everyone just had more empathy, they'd be more moral. I'm not exactly sure that that would be true. I don't, I'm not ready to put my confidence there. But I do think that for someone who is sincere already, empathy gives them a lot more tools to work with. Um, but even if you don't have empathy, uh, if you're like, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm weak on that. Like, I'm, I'm not a very empathic person. You can always give space to people and to yourself and, and listen, right? Um, Theo comes back here, says, uh, I agree that having the emotions could be a double-edged sword because having too much emotion that's uncontrollable will diminish the quality of the debate and could go away in finding the truth and turn toward finding what we feel is true. Um, that last point about, or uh, turn away, away from, yes, yes, yes. Um, we could turn away from finding the truth and turn towards finding what we feel is true. Um, yeah, when I think about how I don't always get to decide how I feel about things. In fact, I'd say most of the time I don't get to decide how I feel about things. Um, my partner, and, and I'm not talking behind her back. I've asked her many times before if I can use her as an example in my classes with my students. Um, she's, she's a therapist, and she's always like, everyone who does therapy does it because they need therapy. Like, therapists have problems. And she's always like, if there's any kind of good things you can do with using me as an example, go for it. Um, but she's she's got a lot of emotional programs built into her psyche that she didn't decide on, that she didn't choose for herself. Um, her childhood, her parents were less, less than ideal situations. And she has all these uh, programmed reactions that she doesn't agree with, she doesn't endorse and yet affect her anyway and influence her actions and influence her thinking and um she very often is resentful to herself <laughs> about the emotional reactions that are popping up and um if we have a way of proceeding about making decisions about what we're going to believe and what we're going to act on and we're giving all the power to just what feels right to us then it's very much like taking our hands off the wheel. And who knows what are the causal conditions that shaped the psychological, emotional reactions that you have to different scenarios. Um, sometimes I, I think they are like legitimate intuitions. Like in a case where, uh, I'll use this example when we do Aristotle, imagine a baseball player um, they're not thinking analytically when they're up at the plate deciding whether to swing at that pitch. They're doing it intuitively. Thought, that feels good. That pitch feels good. That pitch doesn't feel good. Some, some of them are really observant. They might know, oh, with that wind up, the pitcher's throwing this kind of pitch or something like that. But um, the, the feelings that they have are trained out of the experiences they've had playing lots of baseball. And so their reactions to things might have a greater role to play in sorting out things like uh, as being like rational contributors to the debate than if you just throw someone up there to the plate for the first time and figure out you know what are their intuitive reactions to it. So sometimes, um, like my my partner's been doing therapy for a while now, and her intuitive reactions to what's going on with her clients, I mean, she's trying to be open to every person being different, but there's some things that are, you know, get calibrated. You're like, I've seen this before. This is familiar. I have a guess of where this is going. I'm not going to prejudge the whole situation, but it informs it. Um, Theo, are, were you clarifying your, your comment from before? Turning away from facts? Uh-huh. We might have to talk about facts here sooner or later, too. Um, this was one of the big tangents I got into with my other class earlier today, but... Um, there's uh, 
okay, yeah, let's just do this really quickly. Um, well, I don't need to draw this. Um, so I, and I'm going to turn my hat back around for this one. I know, I know we've just been talking about the first of four topics here for like an hour, but um, I, I think this is good territory. I, I hope you feel similarly. If you don't, if you think I'm kind of wasting time or something, let me know. Uh, we might have different ideas of what's useful and helpful, but I always appreciate feedback. Because I am trying to pack as much important and useful information and ideas into this crash course in as short of a time as we possibly can, so I want to use it efficiently. But um, this is this is going to be a really central um, conceptual and theoretical distinction for um, moral philosophy and the and the theories we're about to study. So we make claims, right? We say something is true. All claims come in one of two flavors. There are descriptive claims and there are normative claims. Descriptive claims are about how the world is. And normative claims are about how the world ought to be. So descriptive claims are like, what are the states of affairs of the world? Like, what time is it? Who is the president? How many coins are in my pocket? Are there aliens on Alpha Centauri that like Nicolas Cage movies? All of those are descriptive claims because they're just claims about what is going on. And usually when we talk about facts, um, oh, oh, Theo, you weren't using facts this way, but I'm going on this tangent anyway. <laughs> this is important. We'll need to talk about it sooner or later anyway. Um, a lot of times when we throw the word fact around, we usually have in mind something like a descriptive claim that is so incontrovertible it's beyond having to debate. Like, it is a fact that I'm holding a microphone in my hand. How could you deny this? Right? But it's about descriptive states of affairs. And I'm sure, I'm pretty confident that you've heard the fact-opinion distinction at some point in education up to this point. And the fact-opinion distinction is what I'm, I'm really kind of in the process of grumbling about right now. Um, Descriptive claims that are beyond uh, doubt are usually what we think of as paradigmatic facts. Um, and when it comes to opinions, or when it comes to normative claims, claims about what's good and bad, what's right and wrong, what's appropriate and inappropriate. Um, normativity also includes things like aesthetics, like beauty. Um, when we're making those kinds of claims, there's more of a temptation to say, well, they're just opinions, and they're not facts. Now, of course, there can be facts about, like, what are your values? Like, do you think X, Y, or Z is good? Well, you know, Joe thinks it's good is a, you know, that's that could be a descriptive claim about just what Joe's values are. But when we're thinking about the claims themselves or the values themselves, um, I've definitely heard from many people before, many students before, that's like, how can you have a debate about these things? They're just people's subjective opinions. There's, there's no factual basis to appeal to something uh, to prove that some of these moral principles are the truly correct, objective, universal ones that we should all be following. Um, and I think there's a, a little bit of a mistake there. So really all an opinion is is just a belief. And you can have opinions about descriptive matters too, even ones that are well supported like with scientific consensus and stuff like that. Um, like, do I think it is a fact uh, that there's human-caused climate change happening? Yes, I do think that's a fact, in the sense that it's an opinion I have, it's a belief I have, that I think is so well-supported that it's beyond reasonable doubt um, at this point. And we, if you want to have a debate with me, we can have a debate around facts. Like, do you think that thing deserves to be called a fact or not? Well, we can look at the empirical evidence that's available, since we're talking about an empirical matter, and the reasoning that we're doing with that empirical evidence, and, and we can have a debate about that. And I think that's what people think um, uh, is what you can have debates about, but they might be more pessimistic if they're, like, if they're thinking all moral matters are just are just opinions, is that there's nothing to settle it. There's no way to make a proof. Um, but when it comes to normative matters, yeah, they're going to have to be proven in a different way. Um, the pessimism, I think, comes from expecting that all rational argumentation has to terminate in descriptive evidence or empirical evidence or something like that. And that is, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, that that is not true. There are some philosophers who claim that. 
and the ones that are honest recognize that this means they're committed to a position that there is no moral truth. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, but um, a little with especially with relativism later on. I don't know if we'll get to it today, but very soon, Tuesday definitely at the latest. Um, that'll be a non-starter for any kind of rational discourse about um, moral matters. If there's no truth about it, then there's no truth seeking to be done about it, right? All we would be doing is just taking a survey of different perspectives and being like, what do you like, right? Kind of like what you were worried about, Theo, earlier, of us deciding what we're going to judge is just and right and what our moral obligations are just based off of our feelings or our preferences or what we feel like doing or not doing. Um, and that seems to put morality on far too shaky of a footing. And there's better arguments to offer for why that shouldn't be thinking it's true, but more on that later. Um, bottom line is that you cannot justify normative conclusions off of only descriptive premises. And I can actually turn my hat back around for this. Um, let me give you an example. And I used to I used to use this example for many years before I had a child. Now I have one, and it's totally apt, actually. Unfortunately, I'm sad to say, but um, let's say uh, my two-year-old, almost three-year-old is hanging out with his cousin, and he's hitting him, which he does. That's the sad part. Um, pushes him all the time and stuff. And my poor cousin, he's like, space, space. Doesn't doesn't like it. Um, we're working on it. But uh, I, let's say, I mean, my, my two, almost three-year-old is um, getting very verbal right now. And very, I can't quite do this with him yet, but in the near future, this is going to happen, where I might say, Luke, his name's Luke, Luke, hitting is wrong. You shouldn't hit. You shouldn't hit Obius. You shouldn't hit people. And he might go, "Why?" You know, like kids do. Like, why is that wrong? Why shouldn't I do that? And I might try to. So that claim, the conclusion claim, you shouldn't hit people. That's a normative claim. It's a matter of what we ought to do, uh, what's right and wrong, good and bad, stuff like that. So that's a normative claim as the conclusion. And I'm trying to back it up with some reasons some argument, some premises. If I argue this way, I might try arguing this way. I might say, well, Luke, when you hit people, it causes them pain. That claim is just a descriptive claim. It's just a claim about how things causally work in our world. Generally, I mean, it doesn't always happen, right? If I'm wearing a suit of armor and you hit me, it's not going to hurt me. But all other things being equal, hitting usually leads to pain. It causes pain. Um, so consider that argument, and it might sound like a good one. You might be like, yeah, that, that's why hitting is wrong. That's why I don't hit people. That's why I don't hit my students, because it causes them pain, right? That's why you don't hit each other. Um, but imagine my son saying in response to that argument, oh, I, I know. That's why I hit him. I know it causes pain, right? He can accept the premises of that argument, and he doesn't have to accept the conclusion logically. Right? It doesn't force him into, into endorsing the conclusion. That is, unless we added something to the argument. What if we added in a hidden premise here? And I, and I think that's what's happening. If you find that argument, the initial argument I offered, compelling, it's probably because you're anticipating a, um, a suppressed premise here, uh, a hidden premise, an unspoken assumption that causing pain is wrong. That's a normative claim. Causing pain is wrong. So if I know causing pain is wrong, hitting causes pain, now I do have a pretty solid logical case for saying hitting is wrong. Okay, But it took it took a, not just the descriptive fact all by itself, but it had to be coupled with a normative principle in order to be justified, in order for the argument to actually be logical. Um, and I think that's part of uh, what people are worried about is, well, how do you defend those normative principles, much less the fundamental ones? That's a question, that why question, is what I'm going to be focusing on a lot when we get to the ethical theories. But keep in mind this normative descriptive claim distinction. It's very important. Um, and it's why we can't use science to give us morality all by itself. Because empirical observations, the things science trades in, only tell us about how things are. They can't tell us about how they ought to be. Just because something is happening doesn't mean it's good. Just because something isn't happening doesn't mean it shouldn't be. So. Um, chat, how's that going? That making sense? That distinction? And its rational uh, implications? Yeppers.
Groovy. Awesome. Yes, yes. Okay. Cool. Looking good. Um, my suggestion is we take a short break because I've been yapping my head off for over an hour and I'm getting hyperventilated. So let, let's take a little break. We'll cool down for five, ten minutes, something like that. And, um, and I'll be back in a second and we'll finish this up. And I, I promise, um, let's see, I'm, I'm not going to keep you past, let's say, 940. And if you need to bolt earlier, that's totally okay and understandable. Um, I'm not going to make this video extra duper, super duper long. Uh, I want to respect our time and, and the YouTuber's time too, your time also. Um, but I want these, I want, I intend for these video sessions to be approximately the same as if we had our usual, uh, what is it? Two hours, 10 minutes class period, um, when we meet in person. So I want you to get your money's worth from your education. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. And if you have more thoughts or questions that pop up, I'll ask you about them when I get back. All right, we're back from the break here. Um, so uh, in terms of our, our queue of four topics, we talked about the first one. So we're really, we're going through a blazing speed here. But the next one I think I can do fairly quickly. And then I think maybe we'll be able to get through the third one before the end of tonight. Uh, and that's the topic of egoism. But the, the next topic is um, I wanted to say some things about religion and about culture. Um, and uh, this is kind of another one of my like proposals or recommendations for how we do things in our class. Um, I think it, it could be relevant for this class. It's been relevant when I've taught business ethics in the past. It's definitely relevant when I'm teaching my other philosophy classes too. Um, so I, I, like I had a class last quarter, it was like probably 75% of the students in the class were religious. And so religion came up a lot as we were talking about all sorts of things, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, the whole gamut of philosophy. What is reality? How do we have knowledge? How should we live? Those are the three basic questions of philosophy. Um, and uh, I, I'll try to make this snappy. So my advice or my proposal is um, that if you have a religiously informed ethical perspective or moral perspective, your perspective is a voice in the conversation and has a seat at the table. And I, I wouldn't want any of my students to not bring up their perspectives out of some kind of self-consciousness around them being religious. Um, if you ask me, and hat's fully turned here, I can definitely imagine a debate around this. So I, I say this with modesty and an openness to some critical debate about it. But if you ask me about what um, sort of defines religions, if we take off the part about the institutional aspect and um, like ritual and stuff like that, a religion really kind of boils down to a metaphysic, a in other words, a, a kind of perspective on reality of like what's going on in reality. It can include spiritual things like God or souls or reincarnation or whatever, right? That has a metaphysical kind of a component to it, and it also has an ethical component. And, and sometimes they're married together very, very closely. Um, but that's philosophy. I mean, that's what philosophers who are atheistic or agnostic, that's the business that they're playing in. That's the topic that they're concerned with. Um, and theology is basically just philosophy about religious subjects. The processes look very similar. Um, the rational criteria look very similar. Sometimes people um, want to cleave a bigger difference here between um, secular reasoning and religious reasoning. I'm personally, I'm not quite buying that. Um, a lot of times, I think this is connected with uh, a perceived fight or conflict between science versus religion, which I don't find compelling very much at all. I know other people do. If you want to debate that with me, we could do it. But at the bottom line is that there are some pretty interesting and sometimes unique and novel uh, moral concepts and moral ideas and ways of looking at the moral reality, the moral landscape. This is a metaphor I'll actually use quite a few times here in this class, the moral landscape, like the, the states of things when it comes to the moral dimensions of life that are 
that really enrich the conversation. Um, and you don't necessarily have to be wedded to that religious tradition in order to entertain those ideas and maybe even find them possibly compelling. Um, sometimes you can pull the metaphysics apart from the ethics. Maybe in some cases you can't. There's some sticky stuff here, and I'm not trying to minimize the stickiness, but there's at least the room for that to be a part of the conversation. Um, so that's on the one hand, is I'm, I'm recommending, like, bring up, bring up those perspectives. If those are your sincere views, bring them up. They're a part of the conversation, and I definitely don't want them to be silenced. And even if I wasn't personally religious, I would feel the same way. Like, I live in a lot of different worlds um, in, in over the course of my life I've uh, and, and part of it is my um, the philosophy world which is for the most part or well not for the, there's a lot of religious philosophers out there too but it's very often populated with secular ideas about metaphysics and ethics um, and so it's not like when I'm having a debate with some people at my church or something, uh, or with some fellow Buddhists or something, we can like take some stuff for granted as a part of our debates. Um, you can't take that stuff for granted with other people. And you can still have dialogue around these things. That's been my practical experience actually doing it, um, that that's possible. And I've seen it happen in classrooms too, and so I think it can happen for us as well. But, and there's a little but here, the other side of this is that in joining the game, and bringing those religious perspectives in, they're also going to be held critically accountable in the same way that we're going to hold critically accountable any perspective on morality that's being offered. We are going to ask for argument. There is shouldering a burden of proof that's going to be required here. And sometimes religiously informed moral perspectives have a pretty heavy dose of other metaphysical commitments that um, are appealed to as a part of the authority or the rationale behind following those moral principles or living with those moral values. Um, and that that can be open for us to criticize just the same as anything else. So it's kind of like fair is fair. Um, but what this kind of ends up meaning is that um, just because uh, a view comes from a religious tradition doesn't make it de facto legitimate. Um, in this, It's legitimate in the sense of like, it's worth entertaining, right? But it doesn't mean that it's right, or that people who aren't a part of that tradition can't criticize it. At least for the purposes of our conversations in this class, that's what I'm proposing. Um, that if anyone wants to advance a view on some of these matters, we're going to ask them to shoulder their burden of proof about it. But, um, but I, I don't mean that to be any kind of discouragement either. Um, being religious myself, living in secular worlds with philosophy, and even doing this east-west bridging things that I do with being a Lutheran and a Buddhist simultaneously, um, and someone who is very committed to standards of critical reasoning and logic, um, I have some experience with wrestling with the, the finer points and dilemmas in this domain. So if you're feeling uncertain about how do you participate in this class or how do you do philosophy and in the context of also being religious, I'd be very happy to talk to you about that more at length. Uh, if you want to talk outside of class in, per, uh, in person or over the phone or something, I'm very, very happy to have those kinds of conversations. And, and maybe I might have something useful to offer, um, um, but at the very least, I'd be happy to listen to you and hear what you have to say. And if you want to get into debates about it too, I can do that too. Um, but... Uh, in, in a similar way, I, I put this as religion slash culture because a similar thing goes down, right? Not everyone subscribes to the same religion. Not everyone comes from the same culture. And uh, we need to know about what's going on in other cultures too. So just the same way that I'm inviting um, religious perspectives that you have a voice in this conversation, if you have values and perspectives that are coming from cultures that are not... Um, uh, the cultures we find around ourselves, you know, locally here, those are also voices that should be in this conversation, and we need to hear about them. As critical thinkers, what we're trying to do is look at all the possibilities. We're not just, we're never going to say, oh, well, this is consistent with American values, so it's right for us. That's something I would encourage us to avoid. Um, this is going to get into our topic on relativism, which I don't think we're going to get to tonight, but we'll talk about in person on on Tuesday so maybe if you have some thoughts about this we can we can discuss it more then but 
when we're face to face in person. Um, but just the same way that the religion doesn't have this automatic legitimacy of being right, cultures don't get this status either. We can criticize our own culture, and and at least there's a theoretical option for criticizing other cultures too. Now, there is a very good reason why you might hesitate on that, because you may not know what you're talking about. <laughs> this is something I think about all the time, that I'm ready to critically engage with cultures that are not mine, and that I don't live in and that I don't participate with, but only if in as much as I'm capable of understanding them and in as much as I don't have contact with it and haven't been raised in it and all that kind of stuff, it's very possible that I'm not understanding what's happening with it and my criticisms will miss their mark for the same reason that you can't ever criticize something you don't understand. Right? Understanding always has to happen first. Listening has to happen first before we can then evaluate. And um, so if you have hesitancy on criticizing what's going on in other cultures, there can be some really reasonable grounds for being worried about that or being modest about that, while still being theoretically open to saying no culture is like beyond the possibility of criticism just because it's that culture. So there's a lot more to say about this. I will get into some more of this with the relativism discussion. Um, because that's going to be relativism is a view that's just directly endorsing what I just said. I encourage us to reject. Um, so we will have a talk about that, and I don't want to be dismissive about it. And we're going to try to take it seriously and look at it seriously in as, as much time as we have to talk about it. Um, but if anyone in the chat has some things you want to ask, uh, even at this early stage here, I'd be very welcome to letting you chime in on this, um, even though I'm kind of trying to do this quickly. Any any thoughts there from the chat? Anyone have something that they'd want to add in on that? There will be opportunity to talk about it later, like I'm saying, uh, especially on Tuesday. But if there if you've got any burning things you want to throw down, I could very easily imagine that to be true with some of the things I'm saying. I'm I'm very much welcoming them right now. Anyone got anything? All right, so um, we'll pick that thread up again uh, later, but um, let's so uh, let's try to finish off with the remaining 20 minutes we've got here. Let's try to do this egoism thing, and I'll and I'll try to do this uh, in a snappy sort of way. And if we have more that we want to discuss with it um, on Tuesday, we can do that too. Um, Tuesday can be a space for a lot of hanging threads. Okay, so why do I want to talk about egoism? Um, the reason I want to talk about it, I don't need to turn my hat for this one. Um, the reason I want to talk about it is because before we get into these uh, pretty robust theories that are proposing how we should understand what morality is asking for, like what is the actual shape and contours of that moral landscape, there are some issues or questions or debates <coughs> that I like to call gateway topics because they're kind of like gates to that whole realm of exploring morality and and doing that kind of inquiry and committing to the effort that it requires um, such that like if certain answers are given to these gateway topics we may not even go down that path at all in in other words this whole class is a waste of time <laughs> or not worth doing or something like that and egoism is one of those things that um, threatens uh, whether we should be kind of morally interested at all um, and the way it works is like this. And, and oh, and the other reason I don't bring this up, uh, I don't make as big of a deal with egoism at the beginning of my ethics classes, but I, uh, as I do in business ethics, because this topic I think is particularly salient or relevant uh, and important to the world of business, because you oftentimes can find people um, like Gordon Gecko types or something, if you know that movie, those movies. 
um, you can you can find a, a culture in the business world that basically treats the world of business um, and the economy as kind of like a moral free zone that it's like an amoral space um, that morality just doesn't come into it. It has nothing to do with morality. It's competition for profit. That's it. It's a practical matter. It's not a moral matter. Um, that's what's behind when people make the joke business ethics. Isn't that an oxymoron? Like as if it's impossible to have business ethics entirely. And that kind of culture oftentimes needs to justify itself even if it's you know not all that interested in being morally sensitive explicitly, uh, but it might give excuses, right? It might um, rationalize its perspective. Now, I, I don't think this view is right, but um, one of the methods by which it might try to rationalize itself is with a position called psychological egoism and its uh, cousin, ethical egoism. So egoism has these two different variations on it. Using some of the terms we talked about earlier in this lecture tonight, um, psychological egoism has to do with a descriptive claim about what we are like. And ethical egoism is a normative claim about what our standards should be about how we ought to be. Okay, So the, wor the logic works like this. Psychological egoism, the thesis of psychological egoism, is that every action everyone performs ever, 100% of the actions that are ever performed, they're always performed from self-interest with regard to the self. Everything I do is selfish, thus altruistic action, that is, action done for the sake of another person, is impossible. Now, of course, there are actions that are going to be sensitive to the well-being of others, even under psychological egoism, but e psychological egoism is saying that's not the reason that they're performed. Like, I might try to benefit you, if it benefits me. So I'm not really concerned about you. I'm really concerned about me. You're just, my concern about you is just a, a means for me to be concerned about myself. It's like as a, as a teacher, if I was like, I want my students to be happy with me because if they're unhappy, I might get fired. If that was my only reason for it, if like my only reason for applying sincere effort in teaching all of you was just to protect my paycheck, then that would be an egoic act. That would not be an altruistic act, even if you end up benefiting from it. It wouldn't be altruistic. Altruism is defined by having sincere regard for the value of others for their own sake, independently of how that val it has value for me. Um, so psychological egoism is saying altruism impossible. And because it's impossible, then you get the jump to ethical egoism, which says, and that's fine. <laughs> There's no moral problem with that. Ethical egoism is, I, I think, more appropriately defined as a negative thesis. Ethical egoism is really saying you don't have any moral responsibilities or obligations to be concerned about what happens to other people. It is totally permissible and fine for you to be only concerned with yourself. Self-interest is morally permissible. That's what ethical egoism ends up saying. So um, that's a concern, right? But, oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I forgot something. The grounds on which ethical egoism could be derived from psychological egoism is actually uh, utilizing a normative principle that we think of as pretty essential for moral reasoning. And it's this principle. You can only be held morally responsible for things that were within your control. And things that are outside of your control, you don't have moral responsibility about that. I mean, you might want to be concerned about them. They could be good or bad things, but they can't be things that you can you can have moral obligations to do. Like if there's a kind of classic example here, if there's a school on fire five miles away from me, and there's a kid trapped on the top floor, and if someone doesn't pull them out in five minutes, like go into the burning building and pull them out, they're going to die. Well, I can't be expected. I if the if uh, a kid if that kid dies, you can't hold me morally accountable for that. You'd be like, Tim, why didn't you go over there and save that kid's life? Don't you value their life? And be like, I don't have a car. I'd have to run over there. I can't run five miles in five minutes. I'm I'm not. I I can. I don't know if I can run five miles in 
an hour. I don't, I don't know. I, maybe I underestimate. I don't know. I'm not much of a runner. I'm an academic, sedentary lifestyle and all that. Um, but I, it's impossible for me. It's just physically impossible for me to do it. So I can't be held morally responsible for failing to do something that's physically impossible for me to do. Well, if psychological egoism is true, that it's actually psychologically impossible for us to be concerned about anyone other than ourselves, then to have a moral expectation that we should be altruistic is just setting us all up for failure in an unreasonable way. So it's leveraging a very compelling moral principle that pretty much all the ethical theories we're going to look at agree to, although I have some of my doubts about it, but that's a deeper can of worms here. Um, but it's leveraging a, a plausible ethical principle um, to get a what seems to be very counterintuitive result. Now, I don't know, maybe some of you are like straight up ethical egoists. Um, Anne Rand, you may have heard of before. She's an ethical egoist. She calls her position objectivism, which is one of the most annoying titles for a philosophical theory ever. It's like saying I'm rightism or something. Um, but her position is that you have a moral obligation to be selfish and you shouldn't, it would be moral, it would be immoral for you to attempt to be altruistically concerned with others. It's a pretty, pretty bald statement right there. But what I want to talk about is psychological egoism because everything about the argument here for ethical egoism kind of depends on that, um, at least in the version I'm giving you tonight. And eth uh, psychological egoism can be pretty compelling to people. I've seen it like, like Someone gets in touch with this idea of like, oh, maybe everything I do is selfish and starts finding it pretty plausible and gets convinced by it. Um, almost there, there's very, very few philosophers that think of psychological egoism at, is at all rationally viable at this point, um, especially with some work in the last 20, 30 years. There have been some pretty powerful arguments that are like, yeah, e psychological egoism is just not going to be able to defend itself as the most rationally defensible position on this issue. That the possibility of altruism is the far more rationally justified position to take here on human nature, on human character. Um, but let's talk a little bit about why. What are the big concerns here with psychological egoism? Um... I have eight minutes. Let's see how fast I can I can bust these out. And if you have questions, we can we can discuss it more on Tuesday. And those of you in the chat, if you want to hang around and ask me questions, you're very welcome to. Um, I'm not going to go straight to bed. First up, psychological egoism, while being compelling and plausible to a certain extent, is very extreme. I think one of the things that makes it more compelling is just the possibility of it, right? It kind of can elicit a kind of paranoia. Because it is possible. I can't imagine how all the things I think I'm doing altruistically are really deep down pretty selfish, right? Even Kant says, everywhere we turn in ourselves inwardly, we find our dear self. And he's saying it in kind of a tongue-in-cheek way, um, in, in an, a tone of irony here, sarcasm, actually, I should say, a sarcastic tone he's using. Um, that we have egos and they get into everything. I mean, self-interest is ubiquitous in terms of our considerations for how we're going to act. We're pretty obsessed with ourselves. Um, we all have, I think, some degree of narcissism that we have to struggle with, even if we're not clinically diagnosable narcissists uh, or have narcissistic personality disorder as the DSM would have it or something like that. Uh, it's something that we all have to struggle with. And so I think we know, like, yeah, in any particular case, I'm never really 100% sure that I am truly, sincerely altruistic. But psychological egoism is saying something more like, you could be selfish. It's saying you are selfish in every action. Everything that's ever done, this is the explanation for why it was done. The self-interested motive. And that is very extreme. And you're going to get counterexamples. Uh, the psychological egoist here gets tons of counterexamples that... Maybe they're able to tell a story about, like a classic one philosophers discuss is like the soldier that jumps on the grenade in the foxhole to save the other people in the foxhole. How is that a selfish act? And there's ways in which you can uh, create a story for how uh, it really is something selfish. But you always have to ask yourself the question, not just can I tell an egoistic story about this, but is that story the most plausible story for explaining why they did what they did? 
I mean, how is that more this really big, long song and dance about how always oh, just thinking about his reputation for after he dies and he's attached to his legacy and or the shame or guilt he would feel if he didn't do this act of sacrifice or blah, 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 blah. How is that more plausible or a better explanation than just saying, like, he cares about those people for their own sake? Right. So that's the first problem. Now, that problem is not the most fatal one. But it definitely gets the ball rolling here. Second problem. Um, psychological egoism gets a lot of its plausibility, in my opinion, and the opinion of some other philosophers here too. I'm not alone in this. Um, on what is a really suspect argument. So a lot of times psychological egoists observe a, a fact which seems undeniable, which is that you only ever act on motives that are yours. Like, I never act on your motives. Like, if you've got a, a psychological desire in your head, it doesn't affect my will, right? Those are, they're independent, right? Unless you imagine us having hive minds and we're psychically connected or something and I think something and you do it or you think something and I do it. Like, that doesn't seem to be how we work. Um, all of us have, as Bernard Williams puts it, like a subjective motivational set, a like set of desires and values that uh, are the basis on which our will gets determined, either intentionally or unintentionally. Like we have a psyche, right? Um, a motivational aspect to our psyche. And my, my motives, different than your motives. They, may, they could align, like we could end up having desires for similar objects or outcomes, but um, they don't need to. And for you to have one and me to have another, like, my motives explain my actions, your motives explain your actions, and never shall the twain meet, uh, meet or cross or something, right? So that seems pretty plausible. But for psychological egoism to say, well, because you only ever act on your own motives, everything therefore you do is selfish, confuses whether a motive is mine, whether it's in my sphere of concern, with whether the motive has as its object myself as the object of value or the object of concern. In other words, who has the motive is a completely logically separate thing from what that motive is concerned with, what the content of that motive is. If you're going to be altruistic, the point is not that you act on other people's motives. It's that you have a motive that cites what happens to them and their well-being as the object of concern. Right. So this argument, um, I've heard it before many times. Um, and I think it's part of the, the undeniability of the premise of the argument is what seems to give psychological egoism some more, um, gives people more conviction about it. But under analysis, it's just making a logical category mistake here. Um, and it diffuses the force of that consideration pretty immediately. The fact that we only act on motives that are ours doesn't speak one way or the other about psychological egoism. It's just, it, that fact is just as easily compatible with us having altruistic motives. Okay, so that's reason number two. I got two minutes to do reason number three. I don't know, this one's a more complicated one. Chat, how are we doing so far? I'm, I'm kind of moving a little more quickly now. Please, you know, pop up if, you, if you, anything of what I'm talking about is confusing. Okay, this is a new argument. This is just in the last couple decades. And uh, I think it, it's kind of put the nail in the coffin to a certain extent. Um, so... The whole game that psychological egoists are playing is something like when you think you're being altruistic, you're really being selfish, right? It's, it's got that kind of deep down, it's really selfishness. Like altruism is impossible, right? This third objection to psychological egoism is totally flipping the script on psychological egoism. Its claim, the, the objection here, is saying actually you can't be self-interested only. In order to be self-interested, you have to care about things that are not you. Now, uh, that's the basic idea of it. Let me try to flesh that out a little bit more. The idea here is that if we're imagining my say, um, subjective motivational set, right? Like this, this set of everything that I care about. If the only thing populating it is I have value and nothing else does, that doesn't create... Uh, any platform from which I can choose to do any actions. I'm not able to give any substance to what does it mean for me to care about myself or to treat myself as an object of value. 
I'm going to have to care about something that's not me. I'm going to have to make a claim that something else has value in order to flesh out what it means for my self-interest to be promoted. Now, the philosopher who, who first really advanced this explicitly used the example of hockey, which is kind of silly, I guess, but he was I, maybe he was trying to make a point with it being silly. Um, he's like, if all I ever care about is going to watch hockey, I'm like totally selfish about my desires here. Well, there's one thing that I value that's not me. Hockey. I think hockey has value. And as soon as I say that like hockey has value in a way that doesn't uh, – Sorry for that break. I ran out of disk space to recording this video. So um, I'm back, though. But this third argument is saying, um, I think I was, I was talking through the hockey example. So I have to admit that hockey is kind of, in some way, like objectively valuable in order to say I am benefited if I get to enjoy hockey, right? If I get to have, if I get to play it, I get, if I get to watch it, then it's valuable. Or if I'm like, if I just only, like, let's take a very common form of selfishness, like, I'm concerned about my own pleasure. I have to treat pleasure as something valuable. And what's interesting about this, I mean, this doesn't automatically lead directly to valuing other people for their own sake or something like that. But it's like, it is definitely got the foot in the door. Because as soon as I admit that there's something that's not me that has value, then the natural question will be like, okay, well, if that thing just has value, then why isn't it more good when someone else gets to go to the hockey game or someone else gets the pleasure? What's the what what's the rational line to draw in the sand between you getting that pleasure and someone else getting that pleasure? And there doesn't seem to be one to argue for there. So the the idea that we could do that all of our actions ultimately spring from self-interest is this under the the argument of this objection implausible that it it wouldn't be able to explain any action if the only thing I cared about was myself. Um, I am struck, I don't, I don't know of any other philosophers who have made this connection, but um, that I am aware of, I'm sure there's probably someone out there, I don't think I'm that big of a genius on this, but I'm really struck by how this argument's logic fits very closely to how Buddhism talks about the ego and the self. Um, the Buddhism talks about uh, the self as a house builder, that it always has to build something to become attached to, to define itself into existence. And that on its own, it's empty. It's nothing. It has to build a house because it doesn't have any existence on its own. It doesn't have any content. It doesn't have any meaning. The self, full stop, is nothing. It's only when I treat some other things as valuable and then become attached to them that then I can identify with them or build them into my identity and thus define myself from there. So that's kind of interesting um, that there's that kind of crossover. So uh, in my class earlier today, a lot of students had questions about that argument, and we talked about it quite a lot to try to uh, get the idea across. I don't know how people in the chat are feeling here about it, but um, uh, if you do have more questions about it, you want to ask about it, be happy to try to entertain some of them here. If those of you watching on YouTube, in my quick explanation here, it's like, uh, it didn't quite click for me. I'm not sure I, I completely understand what's happening there. Let's touch base again on Tuesday about it. Um, uh, Walter had a question related to the religion culture part of tonight. Um, took took me a bit to put that question into words, uh, is what you're saying, right? Oh, here we go. Okay. Do you think that there are paths where individuals don't necessarily identify with a particular religion for various reasons, but because these have dominated many narratives in society historically, there may need to be spaces created for the exploration, for arguing that of rooted reasons of why people choose to participate in religion or the conditioning of such gray area. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure I've got the question down perfectly, but um, I, I guess the way I'm, I'm, I'm initially taking your question is that you're wondering, could you be, could it be worth your time to explore or inquire into a religious tradition, even if you don't have a, a connection with it or you don't identify with it initially? Um, I would say the answer to that is yes. You did put all these caveats in about like its historical importance, the the sort of 
role these religion religious traditions have had in shaping our world through history um that is strikes me as actually a different area of inquiry to to understand how a religion uh had an historical impact is not necessarily to really consider the religious perspective itself right you can do that with like a 10 foot pole you don't have to in think about whether the beliefs or doctrines or rituals are appropriate or legitimate in order to think about their causal impact on how the world went. Um, but I, I, I would say it's good to think about that for the sake of history. I mean, it's, it's impossible to tell the story of human history without religion at some point. Um, it's, it's had a pretty big influence. If all you care about is just giving a kind of causal explanation of why things have happened the way they did in history. Um, but I do think that uh, even if you don't like, like I wasn't raised Buddhist. I was raised Lutheran. My dad was a Lutheran pastor. And and I had to go through a phase with myself in, um, started really in high school, but I've kept it up about like, do I just believe in Lutheranism? Like, do I participate with that just because that's how I was raised? Or do I think this is really right? Um, being exposed to it uh, by having it in, as a part of your family's life and stuff like that, or a part of your community, means you've got an intimate acquaintance with it. Um, it could be just as much biasing as it can be informative. And what I found was is a mix of both. <laughs> it's kind of a gray area. Um, and I had to investigate what was going to be the basis of my, of my continued participation with it. And I have found uh, adequate grounds for doing that. But like in the case of Buddhism, I, I wasn't raised in it. I was initially like, oh, that idea is kind of interesting. I'd like to hear more about this. And and I listened to some more of the arguments. And I was like, you know, there's some real solid insight in here. And I'm not part of a Buddhist culture. I mean, I, I don't have uh, friends and family that participate with it. Most of my participation with Buddhism, honestly, is reading Buddhist works, thinking about it, and meditating. <laughs> that's, it. that's a lot of it. Um, so I don't know if I'm getting to your question, Walter. Is this, is this on, on the – am I barking up the right tree? Is this on topic for what you're asking? Yes? Okay, cool. There could be a longer story there too, and I'd be happy to have that conversation with you. Um, for those of you who are wondering, uh, the code word for tonight is thermometer. There's a thermometer on the table, so we'll have that be the code word for tonight. Um, I'll be opening up the quiz uh, where you can submit that code word and prove that you watch the video um, uh, very shortly here tonight on Thursday night. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, it should already be published and you should be able to see it. So, And you'll have through uh, Sunday to, to uh, get that in. I want to give you a nice comfortable amount of time to decide when it's most convenient for you to watch this. Um, anything else from the chat tonight before we uh, button it up? While you're typing out some things there, um, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. I Again, for all the reasons I articulated at the beginning, I really appreciate it. Um, it's really nice having you here, even if I can't see your faces and everything. Um, and uh, we're not all right in front of each other. Um, I really appreciate it. And I hope you're able to come again. And if you aren't, I understand that too. And I understand if you come to some and not others, there's no commitment here about it. It is uh, purely an optional thing. But uh, I do appreciate your presence. And I hope it's valuable to you too. You're very welcome, everyone. All right. Have a good night. Those of you on YouTube, see you on Tuesday. Those of you in chat, see you on Tuesday. Feel free to contact me over the weekend anytime, especially in this early section of the class and you're trying to warm up to what all this philosophy stuff is and, and thinking about ethics and the way that we're talking about it could be new. Very happy to help you with processing all that. So let me know what I can do to help. Never be shy. Uh, well, I can't tell you how to feel, but I don't want there to be any barrier. If you want to talk to me, I'm here and I want to talk to you. Okay, see you around.